Welcome to this video from Ireland Engineering. We're looking today at aerofoil and a wing design for preliminary aircraft design. So, let's start by looking at the nomenclature for aerofoils. On the screen we can see we've got a typical aerofoil. And we're starting on the left here with the leading edge. So the flow is coming from the left to the right of the screen. And so the leading edge is the point where the flow would hit first and then from going moving to the right the thickness is defined as the distance from the upper to the lower surfaces here we have a mean camber line so this is the line that goes from the leading edge to the trailing edge but it's also equidistant from the upper and the lower surfaces trailing edge Cord line is a line that goes from the leading edge to the trailing edge and correspondingly we have a cord length if you like which is often has the lowercase c to symbolize it and finally the camber which is uh, usually the maximum camber which is the distance um, usually measured from the mean camber line uh, to the cord line We'll look at some examples later on in the video. Let's have a brief look at the air, the airflow around the aerofoil. Uh, and again, the direction of the aerofoil, uh, direction of the airflow, sorry, is left to right. Uh, and a very simple explanation uh, is one in, which is often given, which basically goes along the lines of, well, because the air has to go further over the top than the bottom surface, it has to increase speed. The streamlines, as you can see, get more bunched up and due to continuity, they go faster. Now, and, and you can then relate Bernoulli's equation to this to obtain some differences in pressure. Um, I'll look on the next slide uh, why uh, there's, a, there's a slightly different explanation for this. So there's only two fundamental ways in which nature can actually um, impart the forces onto a aerofoil. So on the top here we have the pressure forces, or the forces due to the pressure. Pressure acts normal to a surface, um, and so um, due to the uh, airflow, regardless of what's happening, there's going to be a difference in pressure. Also going to be a shear force due to the viscosity of the fluid flowing over the object. This is going to result in some skin friction and drag. A slightly better representation of this is given on this diagram. Uh, and that pressure difference is quite marked. And you can see here that the upper surface, which has a decreased pressure, uh, and that contributes more to the lift, which is a suction on the top, which is pushing, sucking the, the airfoil up, and the increased pressure on the top and bottom surface is pushing it up as well. But that doesn't have as big an effect as the upper surface. The overall resultant force is, is, is an increase, uh, there's a lift force. But the main takeaway from this diagram is that it is the upper surface that contributes greater to the lift, sometimes as much as 80% at some angles. Another way of uh, interpreting that is to look at a plot of the pressure coefficient here. So this is the norm, this is the pressure which has been uh, uh, non dimensionalized, and um, we will see a very similar distribution you can see the negative pressure on the top corresponding to the suction and on the lower surface we've got compression pushing the airfoil up as well uh, and this is x over c so this is the distance along the cord or the distance along the airfoil normalized with respect to the cord so this pressure distribution which is shown here on the left another way of looking at that is that it's equivalent to a single resultant force which acts at one single point referred to as the center of pressure and that one single force well that can be split into two orthogonal forces and uh, being 
right angles to each other, we refer to these as lift and drag. And we would have to put in a moment in there as well to balance it. Looking at that in a bit more detail then, we've got a cross section here with an aerofoil, we've got the cord line going from the leading edge to the trailing edge again, and we've got the centre of pressure where the resultant force acts due to that pressure differences, and then we've resolved that into two perpendicular forces of lift and drag. Now, it turns out from experimentation that the uh, following characteristics will dictate the aeroform performance. It's the shape of the aerofoil, the plan area, which we use the uppercase S for, units being meters squared, the square of the velocity, V squared, in meters per second, and the density of the fluid, or the air in this case, rho being the symbol. So these are the parameters that have been shown to affect these forces. And this results in these uh, common equations that you've probably seen before, which is that lift equals one half rho v squared SCL. CL is the lift coefficient. Similarly for drag, we have a drag equals one half rho v squared SCD. CD is the drag coefficient. And we have an equivalent equation for the pitching moment. So if we take any particular aerofoil, we will be able to produce a set of characteristic curves. And one of those is the lift curve, which was shown here. So this is the lift coefficient versus the angle of attack. And uh, what we can see is that we have a linear relationship up to some point here, where then the lift starts to fall off again. So this is what's referred to as the stalling angle. So going beyond this, the airfoil goes into what we call a stall. You'll notice that the, the lift doesn't go to zero completely, but there is a rapid deterioration of it. So then, if we want to stay below the stall angle, then we will see that does help us to define various angles for normal flight to operate within. Here are some pictures from a, a wind tunnel experiment for an aerofoil and you can see the streamlines quite nicely with this flow visualisation. We've got quite a low angle of attack here of 3 degrees and as we increase the angle of attack steadily you will notice that we start to see a separation of the flow on the upper surface here so it's starting to go into a stall. Now if we look at a pictorial representation of what's happening at storm, then we can see that we get this separation of the flow and it produces a turbulent mixing and it is that which results in a, a reduction in the lift and an increase in the drag. So we want to avoid this condition. So coming on to drag then, the other main force for aerofoils. Uh, it should come as no surprise if we've got here the drag coefficient on the axis here and here we've got the angle of attack that this uh, drag increases as we increase the angle of attack. Now, one thing that we might be interested in is what's known as the lift to drag ratio. Now, on the left here we've got an equation, very simple, lift over drag. Remember that is going to be the same as the lift coefficient divided by the drag coefficient. We want to increase lift and we generally want to decrease drag. And so you can see from this equation, if you want to increase the lift and decrease the drag, then the whole ratio of lift to drag is going to be increased. So we're looking for a maximum lift to drag ratio. So if we plot the lift to drag ratio, as we've got here on the right, then you can see where it reaches a maximum that's going to be our most efficient angle for the aerofoils to operate at. So these aerofoils, if they were um, fixed at this angle here during the cruise condition, that's going to be our most efficient condition for uh, the majority of the flight. So it's roughly about three degrees for this particular uh, aerofoil, for instance. If you want to improve the results for an aerofoil, 
The only thing you can do is alter the shape, and that usually means altering the camber. Okay, so remember the camber is the line which is equidistant from the upper and lower surfaces of the aerofoil. I've got some examples here on the screen. We can see a general purpose aerofoil on the top. We have a thick aerofoil for higher lift, but there will be higher drag as well. And then second down. And then we've got a transonic aerofoil. So this is for aerofoils that are operating in the transonic flow regime around about Mach number about 0 0.8, high subsonic speeds. And then you will see a very thin aerofoil for a high speed. So that as you can, as you increase your speed, you can see that they tend to become thinner. Now, uh, we've looked at camber earlier on, but a little bit more detail here. You can see here that the maximum thickness in this example is 12%. I'm sorry, the, the position of it is at 12% of the cord and the maximum camber is 0.6%. So it's not a lot of camber on this particular one. And it happens at 40% of cord um, for the maximum thickness, whereas the maximum camber happens to occur at 58% of the cord. And these distances are always quoted as being uh, downstream of the leaning edge. So just in summary then, if we have a symmetrical aerofoil, we could use a very simple graph, the linear portion of the lift curve, which is this bit here, is going to go through the origin of the uh, graph. So in other words, we're not going to produce any lift at zero angle of attack for a symmetrical aerofoil. If we move to a camber overfoil, we will notice that we are able to produce positive lift at zero angles of attack. Now over the years, there are lots and lots of overfoils have been developed and there's lots of families of them. One of the most famous is the NACA uh, um, series of overfoils and there are four digits and five digit series, etc. So I'm just going to look very briefly at a four-digit NACA aerofoil. Now the first digit specifies the maximum camber as a percentage of the cord, whereas the second digit will indicate the position of that maximum camber, and it gives that as a in tenths as a percentage. And the last two digits they will specify the maximum thickness of the aerofoil again as a percentage of the cord best shown with an example. So I've got the NACA 2415. So this aerofoil is going to have a thickness of 15% as indicated by the last two digits. Uh, this will also have a camber of 2% as indicated by the first digit and that will be located 40% or 4 tenths of the way back from the aerofoil leading edge as seen here on this diagram. So there are, there are lots of these aerofoils that you can find off the shelf. So to speak, I've got another one here, which is a 23012, so the 5 series. This is the set of characteristic curves that you can find for aerofoils. And you can see that they've got the lift coefficient shown here, which is reasonably linear. And then you will see the stall. Now you can see there's lots of different um, curves overlaid here because these are for different Reynolds numbers or speeds. But you can see that within the within the linear range is fairly independent of Reynolds numbers. This flat curve here is the coefficient, uh, moment coefficient. So, one way of delaying stall is to introduce uh, high lift devices such as slats and flaps. Um, so we can see examples of those. Boeing 727 for instance. So you'll notice in this cutaway section here that the these high lift devices they're all stowed away during the cruise configuration uh, and then they will clearly they aid to the overall overfall cross section and then when you need them they will come out and be deployed uh, and normally there are takeoff and landing configurations. You can see the overall camber of the overfall has been increased Military examples around the tornado, for instance. Again, if we take a snapshot of the streamlines during uh, stall, then as we've shown before, uh, 
without a slat, just a basic aerofoil here, then we get the flow separation on the upper surface and that leads to this loss in lift and an increase in drag. And if we incorporate, for instance, a leading edge slat, then that helps to delay that um, flow separation on the upper surface and therefore we're able to maintain the lift and reduce the drag. Lots of high lift devices are available and you will find them yourself when you do your research. I've given some examples here, it's not very clear, but on the top left here we've got the basic aerofoil and there are lots of different examples of how you can increase the lift coefficient. Interestingly what I've put on here is this double slotted Fowler flap system because the increase in maximum lift is 100%, in other words it doubles the lift available to you, which is quite quite formidable really. So you can get quite a good increase in performance. Clearly you're going to get an increase in drag as well, so you're not going to want to use this all the time. You're going to want to use it when you really need it at low speeds, which is a takeoff and landing. So this graph is quite interesting because it shows on the bottom here that for the plane wing, and then as you increase that wing with high lift flaps, we get to the, the whole graph basically shifts upwards because we've increased the, the overall camber. But interesting when we add the slots as well, we're able to increase in this direction. And so when you increase, um, we, you want to introduce both flaps and slots, then you make a, quite a significant increase to your lift coefficient. So you can certainly get your extra lift, but always remember it's going to be associated with an increase in drag. So it's available for when you need it. So very briefly then, just at the end, and we've looked just at aerofoils in this um, brief presentation so far, which is the cross section of the wing. I'm now taking a plan view, uh, and when we do that, one of the uh, characteristic features we're looking at is the aspect ratio. And just very simple definition here, we take this rectangle, then the aspect ratio is the, um, the wing span, if you like, divided by the chord C. So here B over C. If you multiply top and bottom of that equation by B, then you will get B squared on the top, uh, and you will get BC on the bottom, and BC is the area which we know as S. So that's another way of formulating that equation. The key here for obtaining the values of aspect ratios for your preliminary aircraft design is to refer to existing aircraft data and choose a representative value. Just as we did in our similar video earlier on, uh, if you look at our earlier videos for wing loading and thrust loading from Ireland Engineering, you'll notice that we did something very similar there. We, we tabulated the values for wing loading and thrust loading, and you will see that there are various patterns. And so it is not unreasonable for you to take a representative value. Just a quick example of what high aspect ratio and low aspect ratio aircraft look like. So, when you are designing your aerofoil aircraft and you want to select an aerofoil, what you're going to be thinking about is selecting it with the primary operating mode in mind, which is, for example, cruise for a transport aircraft. And then you want to introduce these variable geometry, i.e. high lift devices, so that you can get your extra lift uh, for your low speed requirements at late landing and takeoff. You can select an existing aerofoil from the thousands that have already been designed for you. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. And so for your final wing design, having chosen your aerofoil selection, you should now know the thickness, the geometry, the lift, and the drag, and the moment coefficients versus your angle of attack, from, because all of those characteristic graphs will already have been produced. And they'll, be with, they'll be available with the aerofoil data. You need to decide on high lift devices by selecting an approximate increase in lift coefficient. You can choose a representative value for your aspect ratio by looking at existing aircraft designs. And given that you know your wing area S by looking at wing loading, for instance, from an early video, it then becomes possible for you to then calculate the wing span and the cord. So you will know all of the main design variables for your aerofoil and wing design at this point. 
Okay, well that is the end of this video. Um, again, this is from ILEARN Engineering. You will see that we have a range of courses in aerospace engineering as well as mechanical and electrical engineering at our website, ilearnengineering.com.